Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. At Planet Fitness, Leap Day means an extra day of energy. Who doesn't love energy? To celebrate, now through February 29th, you can join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, and pay nothing until March 17th. Even better, you'll get free fitness training and equipment for every workout, with most clubs open 24 hours. So take advantage of your extra day and get energized at Planet Fitness. Join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, cancel any time, and pay nothing until March 17th. Deal ends February 29th. See Home Club for details. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 67, The Second English Civil War Part 2, Britannic Boogaloo. At Planet Fitness, Leap Day means an extra day of energy. Who doesn't love energy? To celebrate, now through February 29th, you can join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, and pay nothing until March 17th. Even better, you'll get free fitness training and equipment for every workout, with most clubs open 24 hours. So take advantage of your extra day and get energized at Planet Fitness. Join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, cancel any time, and pay nothing until March 17th. Deal ends February 29th. See Home Club for details. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realise the historical significance of the woman behind the name, or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Thank you to my House of Lords for their support, including the recent addition, Baron Steve Morrison. Like all of our patrons, they can now listen to this and every other episode ad-free. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. In part one of the Second English Civil War, we saw how royalist riots and revolts were breaking out all over England and Wales, tying down the main forces of the New Model Army under Sir Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell. Parliament was losing control of the navy, as ships defected to the king's cause. In the north of England, royalists had captured the key fortresses of Berwick and Carlisle in preparation for a Scottish invasion in favour of the king. To start today, let's pop over to Ireland, where Inchiquin arranged another cessation of arms with the Catholic Confederacy, which was proclaimed on the 20th of May. And if you listen very carefully, Even from the distance of almost four centuries, you can still hear the echo of a faint bang as the papal nuncio, Archbishop Rinaccini, hit the roof. The nuncio had had a difficult winter. His main value to the Confederacy was in his leadership, his prestige as a representative of the Pope, and the money that came from that position. 
but on all three, he'd been struggling. His leadership was openly questioned, and he'd lost the initiative to the peace faction over winter. The Pope was hesitant to commit much more to the Irish fight unless he saw results. And the money? Well, Rinaccini could still offer some money, but the latest shipment from Rome had been delayed in France for more than a year, and when it arrived, it wasn't enough to swing events in his favour. He'd only stayed in Ireland this long out of loyalty and sympathy for the Irish bishops and Owen Roe O'Neill, the commander of the Army of Ulster, who had consistently backed him. When the peace faction of the Supreme Council began to openly discuss a truce with Inchiquin, Rinaccini seems to have feared for his safety, and he fled Kilkenny in May and took refuge with O'Neill and his army. Rinaccini rightly suspected that the Inchiquin truce was just the first step in another Ormond peace treaty, which was still unacceptable to him, no matter how drastically the wider situation had changed. When the cessation was announced, the nuncio and his allies pointed out that it violated the oath of association which bound the Catholic Confederacy together. The moderates on the council were willing to ally with a murderous heretic like Inchiquin, who had only a few months earlier massacred the people of Cashel and desecrated the Catholic cathedral there. The clerical faction which surrounded Rinaccini threatened to excommunicate anyone and everyone who adhered to the Inchiquin truce and this spiritual front was soon joined by a more military one, as the divisions within the Confederacy once again came to the fore. The Gaelic-Irish O'Neill and his army of Ulster, never fully trusted by the Old English within the Confederacy leadership, backed Rinaccini once again. So at the end of May, Rinaccini pulled the trigger. The peace faction within the Confederacy was excommunicated. When O'Neill backed Rinaccini, the Supreme Council rescinded his rank and authority. Or at least, they tried to. O'Neill and many of his officers who shared his dislike and distrust of the Supreme Council elected to ignore the order, removing him from command. They, at least, stood by the oath they had sworn to religion and to king, and accused the peace faction on the council of selling out the kingdom for, quote, private advantage, even at the cost of the ruin of the kingdom, the violation of their oath, and the extinction of their faith. End quote. After two weeks of back and forth between the peace faction on the Supreme Council and the clerical faction of Rinaccini, Owen Roe O'Neill and the Army of Ulster declared war on the Supreme Council. The Confederate Civil War had now begun. This was both good and bad news for Irish royalists. For Inchiquin, this had been one of his objectives in proposing another truce. He expected that, like the cessation of arms just a few years before, the truce would divide the Confederacy. Gentles go so far as to state that this was Inchiquin's primary reason for the truce in the first place. And this wasn't just because the Lord President distrusted and disliked Catholics, although that was certainly a factor. Just ask the citizens of Cashel about Inchiquin's attitude towards Catholics. Oh wait, you can't. But it was also because Inchiquin correctly realised that the clerical faction of the Confederacy would resist the reintroduction of royal government, in any form short of Catholic self-government. Now, the treaty that would be negotiated between the Royalists and the moderate Confederates wouldn't need to appease them. For Charles, though, this wasn't great news at all, because it almost immediately destroyed any chance that the Royalist cause in England could be assisted by troops from Ireland because Ireland was now having its own civil war. More on that later. In June, we cross back over to Britain, where Lord Loudon, one of the Scottish commissioners who had signed the engagement with Charles, was having a crisis of faith. Not in religion as such, but in the engagement itself. He'd been very resistant to the engagement in the first place. He believed it made too many compromises, too many concessions, to be acceptable to either the Kirk or to God. His doubts only grew stronger as 1648 progressed. Still hoping for a peaceful solution, he was appalled when the Scottish Parliament refused to consider English appeals for mediation in June. This was the final straw, and he publicly broke with the engagement in June and went home. This is not the last time we'll see Loudon. Remaining in Scotland, Remember how I mentioned last time that recruitment for the Engager army was difficult? 
with the Kirk openly preaching against it, and potential recruits fleeing to regions of strong anti-engager feeling like Asher? Well, in June, Asher became the site of the first significant armed resistance against the engager regime. A number of deserters from the army, as well as draft dodgers, gathered near Kilmarnock on Mocklin Moor. This naturally concerned the engagers, who were a bit worried about a large number of armed men just 30 miles from Glasgow, who were openly rejecting their authority. The Earl of Callender, who was the second in command of the new Army of the Engagement, dispatched a force of ten troops of cavalry, commanded by Major General John Middleton and the Earl of Glencairn, to disperse the group, hopefully peacefully. When they arrived, they found a much larger force than they expected. 1,200 men were mounted, and another 800 were on foot. A delegation of ministers met with Middleton, and he was more than happy to provide written assurance. Amnesty for everyone involved in the illegal gathering, if the potential rebels disarmed and departed peacefully. Well, that was a bullet dodged. Until some of the potential rebels, deserters from the army, rejected the deal, fearing that their desertion was not included in the amnesty, and so they'd be punished for it. Others joined them. Why were they even here if they weren't prepared to fight for the Covenant? As the crowd debated what the deal included, whether to accept the deal, what to do if they didn't, Middleton sent an officer to check in and find out what was going on. Unfortunately, the first bunch of potential rebels this officer came across were deserters, and they eagerly shouted that they would fight. So Middleton gave them what they wanted, and ordered his vanguard to charge the rebels. Now this worked very well, until the cavalry lost cohesion, apparently with some of them dismounting to loot the belongings left behind. The rebels, the decision now made for them, advanced on the vanguard and forced them back. Middleton then committed the rest of his force, which was again successful at first, but soon got bogged down as the rebel resistance held and their numbers began to tell. Now Callender, who was at Kilmarnock, was getting a bit worried about the reports he was getting. So he raced to help Middleton, leaving his infantry behind for the sake of speed and dashing to the rescue at the head of a thousand strong force of cavalry. When Callender charged, this time the Covenant has broke. By the end of the day, about a dozen rebels had been killed, with another 50 or so wounded. It wasn't a bloodbath, but it was still a completely pointless skirmish, which did not help the engagers' preparations for war. They remained in power, and a potential threat had been nipped in the bud, but it was not a good omen. Down south, across the border, Sir Marmaduke Langdale, the royalist who had captured Berwick Castle with just a hundred men, opening the eastern road south for the engagers, hadn't been resting on his laurels. In a daring raid south, Langdale managed to repeat his earlier achievement when, on the 5th of June, he captured Pontefract Castle, with just twenty good men. He left Colonel John Morris to hold it in the king's name. The governor of Newcastle, Arthur Haselrig, complained bitterly about the lack of support from the south. Where was the rest of the army? Rebels were holding the border wide open for a foreign invasion, and neither Fairfax nor Cromwell were anywhere to be seen. But as we've seen, it wasn't like the New Model Army was just sat around twiddling its thumbs. In the south of England and in Wales, they were tied up with serious royalist threats, and until the engagers began their invasion, northern royalists were simply a lower priority. But Parliament's fortunes in the north were in good hands. Major General John Lambert spent the two months between Langdale and Musgrave's sudden offensive and the arrival of the Scots, patiently chipping away at the royalist position. He knew he was outnumbered, at least until the South and Wales could be pacified by Cromwell and Fairfax, and so he played for time. Lambert kept building up his forces, harrying the royalists where and when he could, and preparing for the hammer to fall. Back down south, when the Earl of Norwich crossed the county border from Kent and entered Essex, he did so with the remaining dedicated corps of royalists, which had survived Fairfax and had not yet deserted. This hardened force was only 1,500 men strong. And while resentment towards Parliament was far less widespread in Essex compared to elsewhere, 
there were still hotspots. For example, as we've seen, Chelmsford had sent a petition to Parliament earlier in the year, calling for the recall of the King to London, and then afterwards had openly defied Parliament's right to govern. So when Norwich entered the county, he was quickly joined by 1,000 soldiers from the county-trained bands, who defected to the Royalists, and then arrested the remaining parliamentarians in Chelmsford. Norwich soon met up with other Royalist officers and gentry, including the talented Sir Charles Lucas, who held a commission from Prince Charles to command forces in Essex. They gathered at Colchester, Lucas's home turf, and he quickly prepared its defences. He didn't have long to prepare. Fairfax quickly followed Norwich into Essex, and was at the walls of Colchester by the 12th of June. Again, failures of royalist reconnaissance meant that when the sun rose on the 13th, they found Fairfax on their doorstep. Fairfax sent a messenger to demand their surrender. Norwich replied, referencing Fairfax's famously poor health, threatening that he would cure him of all diseases, i.e. he'd soon be dead. While Norwich was fulfilling his role as the stereotypically cavalier cavalier, Lucas did the actual work and prepared his men for battle, forming them up outside the walls. Fairfax fully expected Colchester to be another Maidstone, more bloody and costlier than he'd like, but a quick victory nonetheless. He ordered a brigade to engage the defenders, expecting them to crumble and the town to quickly fall. Instead, his men were forced back not once, not twice, but three times. More than once, the defenders fell back towards the gates, spurring the enemy to chase them, only to turn around and cut them down in an ambush, pushing the survivors back out of the town. After eight hours of battle, the Royalists had taken between 150 and 500 casualties, while the new model army had taken at least 500. Fairfax could not risk more failed assaults. With Colchester so close to London, less than two days' brisk march. A defeat here from overconfidence would risk the capital, or allow the Royalists to escape and link up with the imminently arriving Scots. So he settled in for a siege. His men spent eleven weeks building a complex ring of siege works, complete with bastions and artillery points. The Royalists continued to build up their own defences in turn, Fairfax was forced to draw on many other sources of manpower to fuel his siege and surround the town. He started with only 4,000 men, and he soon gained another 2,500 from the Essex County Militia, and another 3,500 from the Suffolk Militia. This is itself evidence that, whatever royalist sentiment there was in the southeast, Parliament could still count on this heartland for manpower. The royalists were soon outnumbered two to one and that was before Skippen sent a further 1,500 recruits from London. And don't imagine this was a pleasant summer. 1648 was especially wet and rainy, even for England, and the besiegers and the besieged will feel every day of those 11 weeks, and it will have ruthless consequences. We'll leave Fairfax and Norwich to their siege, which will drag on throughout the summer. Back in Ireland, the Confederate schism was growing wider. Owen Roe O'Neill's kinsman, Sir Phelan Roe O'Neill, comes back into our story. Remember him? He helped kick off this whole thing in 1641 with the attempted coup against the Dublin government. What had meant to be a quick, relatively bloodless seizure of power to secure the property and political rights of the so-called deserving Gaelic elite had spiralled into a long and bloody civil war involving forces from the other two kingdoms. Sir Phelan hasn't really been in the narrative for a while, at least since his cousin Owen returned from foreign service and took up his position as General of the Ulster Army. He's been around, though, in the background, quietly seething at his irrelevance. This quiet seething had, by this point, developed into borderline mutinous behaviour against his cousin, and when the peace faction gained the initiative in Kilkenny and talks reopened with the Royalists, Sir Phelan was right there, face deep in the trough of patronage. Remember, Sir Phelan was not a die-hard for Irish independence or anything like that. He was a devout Catholic, of course, but this whole thing was meant to secure his and his allies' positions within the royal administration. So when it became clear that his further advancement was dependent on the return of that royal administration, to quote his biographer, 
he was not willing to jeopardise his rank and estates for the desperate politics of dispossessed natives or the hardline expectations of Tridentine continental clergy." End quote. Distancing himself from his cousin, he won over other subordinates of O'Neill, and by the time Rinascini excommunicated the peace faction, Sir Phelan was able to just ignore his cousin's call to arms. Instead, Sir Phelan joined those prepared to defend Kilkenny against O'Neill and Rinaccini. Also joining the side of Rinaccini was the newly arrived Marquis of Antrim. He's also been out of our narrative for a while. Antrim had been the man who dispatched Alistair McCullough to Scotland, partly to aid the Marquis of Montrose in his royalist campaign, but mostly for very local priorities. He was a lord of the Highlands and Islands, with a passionate rivalry with the Campbells under the Marquis of Argyll, and almost everything he did was dictated by this position. So it was now. His holdings and vassals stretched across the North Channel, and included territories in Ulster as well as the Western Isles. To protect them, and despite his other major rival, Ormond, he threw his lot in with O'Neill and Rinaccini. Together, they would march on Kilkenny, depose the Supreme Council, replace it with one under their control, and repudiate any agreements with the Royalists. Their campaign of July and August 1648 was uneventful. Neither the armies of O'Neill or the Ormondist Supreme Council succeeded in their goals. O'Neill, of course, wanted to capture Kilkenny, but he was never in a position to do that. Instead, he spent the time manoeuvring through the counties, pillaging and raiding and avoiding battles that weren't in his favour. But likewise, the forces raised against him, commanded by General Preston, Inchiquin, Lord Taff, Clan Rickard, and Sir Phelim O'Neill, among others, could not pin him down and destroy his forces. They did eventually force him to withdraw back into Ulster, but only after he caused significant damage. Bridges would be mended in the coming weeks, but the damage was done. The Confederate Civil War was deeply wasteful, and exposed to everyone, in the island of Ireland and beyond, exactly how fractious the Confederacy really was. In Wales, Cromwell and Horton were still bogged down in the Siege of Pembroke. When they'd arrived, their field guns were far too small to damage the thick castle walls, and heavier artillery was ordered to be brought to the siege via sea. Until then, Cromwell played the hand he'd been dealt. He demanded that Colonel Poyer and Major General Lorne, the Royalist commanders, see sense and surrender, but they refused. Much like at Colchester, the Royalist hope was that something would change the game, and their most likely salvation would be the arrival of the Scots. So, on the 4th of June, Cromwell ordered an assault by ladders. Only the ladders were too short, and the attack failed. By the end of June, news came that the ship carrying the siege guns had been caught in a storm and sent to the bottom of the Severn estuary. When that news came, Cromwell ordered another assault on the 24th of June, which also failed. But he finally got some good news when it was reported that the siege guns had been recovered from the mud of the estuary, and they finally finished their journey on the 4th of July. When these cannons opened up, the latest in early modern warfare, Pembroke's medieval walls quickly started to crumble. And with supplies low, the soldiers nearly mutinous, and the citizens of Pembroke Town at their wits' end, on the 11th of July, Poyer and Larne surrendered. They were taken prisoner and sent to London to stand trial for treason. The siege of Pembroke tied up Cromwell and his army for eight weeks, and it finished just in time. Because three days previously, on the 8th of July, Hamilton and the engagers finally crossed the border. The war of the engagement had now begun. That will be the subject of the episode after next, because the next episode is an interview with Dr. Jonathan Healy of Oxford University, author of The Blazing World, A New History of Revolutionary England. So that interview will be published in three days' time, The War of the Engagement will be published three days after that. Thank you to my House of Lords, including the King's favourite, Mike Sanders, the Duke of Bristol, Bill Winkis, the Marquis of Dorset, Thomas Kessler, the Earl of Derbyshire, some guy. You can join their ranks and receive ad-free episodes by going to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. 
Remember that you can join the mailing list to be notified about new episodes and news about the show by going to the link in the description. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. At Planet Fitness, Leap Day means an extra day of energy. Who doesn't love energy? To celebrate, now through February 29th, you can join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, and pay nothing until March 17th. Even better, you'll get free fitness training and equipment for every workout, with most clubs open 24 hours. So take advantage of your extra day and get energized at Planet Fitness. Join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, cancel any time, and pay nothing until March 17th. Deal ends February 29th. See Home Club for details. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts.